Nearly five years ago, a New Hampshire man was left waiting for an appointment through a VA center in Vermont. When you looked at this person's situation, it was clear from what I was reading that the clinicians wanted this person seen right away. From the New England News Collaborative, this is Next. I'm John Dankowski. That veteran never got his appointment, and he later died. We'll have an investigation into whether that death could have been avoided. Also, when town meets gown, tensions are bound to rise. I felt pretty alienated in the city for a long time, and it only started getting better because I'm like actively engaged in dialogue. We'll look at how city residents and college students are finding common ground amidst the ivy and refugees telling their stories in words and music. I think uh, the music language, all the world understand this language. So I like that my brother learn anything about music. It's next. Next is powered by the New England News Collaborative, eight public media companies coming together to tell the story of a changing region with support from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. This is Next. I'm John Dankosky. Coming up, town meets gown in cities large and small. I don't feel like the majority of Yale or like Yaleys um, respect New Haven residents or like treat New Haven residents like we are actually a part of this city. But first, nearly five years ago, a veteran from New Hampshire's North Country died while waiting for an appointment through the VA Medical Center in White River Junction, Vermont. The hospital said no significant delay contributed to his death, but the man's widow disagrees, and questions remain about the process the hospital used to hold itself accountable. New Hampshire Public Radio's Peter Biello investigated. On the last night of Don Tirio's life, his son Brian visited his Berlin home for dinner. Don Tirio was 58 years old, a veteran of the Air Force who served during Vietnam. He'd recently moved back to New Hampshire after living on the West Coast for more than a decade. Brian Tirio says his father was looking forward to reconnecting with his kids and grandkids. And as we were eating, he just kept, like, dozing off, and his wife was kind of like, well, wake up, you're falling asleep, wake up. And he's like, oh, I can't help it, I'm really tired, I'm really tired. Sleeping was dangerous for Terrio. He had sleep apnea, and he'd been trying to get a sleep study done through the White River Junction VA, an appointment his doctors considered urgent, according to sources familiar with his case. He says, yeah, I don't know why they're waiting so long. The next morning, Brian Terrio got a call from the local hospital. His father had stopped breathing during the night. He'd been hooked up to breathing machines, but he had no brain activity. Don Terrio died that afternoon. After he was cremated, Terrio's widow and children each got little urns of his ashes. He wanted them spread up at his childhood places that he liked to hang out at, at like uh, South Pond was one of the places. But Brian didn't scatter them. Something about his father's death left him feeling unsettled. He wasn't quite ready to let go. Nearly two years later, when national attention turned toward how long veterans were waiting for care in VA hospitals across the country, the VA's oversight arm, the Office of Inspector General, or OIG, paid a visit to the VA hospital in White River. That visit prompted a local VA social worker to write an email to her superior. She declined to be interviewed for this story, but in that email, which NHPR obtained from someone else at the VA, she wrote that maybe Tyrio's death, quote, could have been prevented if someone had just given the client an appointment. So that's the question. Could his death have been prevented if the VA had given Don Tyrio his sleep study? Al Montoya, director of the White River Junction VA, declined to talk about the hospital's investigation into Tirio's case, citing federal law, but he spoke in general about the peer review process. Where if there's any kind of negative impact whatsoever, we review it ourselves um, and then uh, make sure that uh, the appropriate care was delivered. That peer review led the hospital to conclude that Tirio died of, quote, an unrelated pre-existing condition. We don't know how the hospital reached that conclusion. That information is protected under federal law. However it was made, Tyrio's widow, Debbie DeLore, disagrees with it. She says her husband's death was caused by his sleep apnea, an ailment she says he'd been waiting for the VA to treat for at least a year. If he was on a CPAP machine or having had the proper bed where he could sleep just about sitting up, that was the only way that he slept, that he breathed halfway normal. Here's what we know about Tyrio's official cause of death. According to his death certificate, Don Terrio died of acute on chronic respiratory failure and septic shock due to aspiration pneumonia. He also had COPD. 
Basically, about 12 hours before he died, something got into his lungs that caused a drop in his blood pressure that led him to stop breathing. How something got into his lungs, we may never know. Without an autopsy, it's all but impossible to figure out what killed a patient with multiple conditions. Joe Anglin, White River Junction's former public affairs officer, says doctors there were aware of Tyrio's condition. When you looked at this person's situation, it was clear from what I was reading that the clinicians wanted this person seen right away. Anglin says he learned that Don Tyrio's physical condition was so bad, the VA determined he needed what's called a stat consult. In other words, an urgent appointment, which his widow says he never got. Anglin says he discovered something even more troubling about that stat appointment. The appointment was made after he died. Anglin says at that point, he began to think the White River VA was trying to hide how it handled Tyrio's care. Anglin says one document from White River to higher-ups at the VA misrepresented Tyrio's case. The White River VA told those higher-ups that there was no way to challenge the outside agency's review of the case. Anglin says that's not true because there was no such outside review. They just accepted the fact we did an internal investigation. Anglin says he told those investigators outside of White River about what he calls a false report and about that appointment allegedly made after Terrio died. A few weeks later, Anglin says, he was fired. Without access to documents of the hospital's investigation into itself, it is impossible to judge its quality or integrity. Anglin says, that's the problem. That's not that great to investigate yourself. I think you need something at arm's length. The White River Junction VA has denied NHPR's multiple requests for information about Tyrio, citing laws protecting patient privacy and records for medical quality assurance programs. That's from a story reported by New Hampshire Public Radio's Peter Biello, who joins us now. Peter, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. How did this story come to your uh, desk, and why did you start reporting on it in the first place? Well, in the spring of 2016, The Office of Inspector General from the VA, which does oversee VA hospitals, issued a report about um, about things that weren't going too well at White River Junction. Uh, It was a, a, a very long report. And on page 17, there was one line that said on May 5th, 2014, a VA social worker from a vet center complained that a veteran died of sleep apnea in 2012 before he could get care. And the line that struck me was the the VAMC WRJ initiated a review and a determination was made that there was no significant delay by the VA that appeared to have had an effect on the patient's death. And I looked at that line and I thought, okay, who else besides the hospital that was responsible for his care looked into this case and figured out what happened? So I, I poked around and I learned that the hospital investigated itself that no one else had taken an outside review of what happened with this uh, unnamed patient. So that's when I sent my first Freedom of Information Act request. And after it was denied, I I, I learned that one of the people who was handling that request was Joe Anglin, who you heard in the story. And he was learning more behind the scenes. And the more he learned about this man's case, the more upset he was. And so eventually it got to the point where He couldn't keep quiet about this anymore unless he was complicit. So he complained to the OIG, and he also told me that he had complained, and he told me a little bit about what he had discovered. And that's what prompted uh, a deeper investigation into who this person was. Is Anglin himself fighting back against uh, his firing? He is. He's contesting it, saying that the, the firing was abrupt and it did not follow proper procedure. Um, and that it was essentially a form of retaliation for uh, speaking to the press and speaking up about what happened with Mr. Tyrio. This isn't the first time you've reported on the White River Junction VA. What other issues there have come up? Uh, the White River Junction VA had a massive budget shortfall at the end of uh, the fiscal year 2016, uh, something of the order of $10 million. $8.5 million of that was sort of plugged by the regional office, which is there for that very purpose, to help uh, regional VA medical centers um, make up for lost money if they happen to have to treat more patients than they were anticipating. And the remaining uh, $1.5 million was made up by by moving money around within the budget. Um, One could argue that this was mismanagement, that uh, Director Al Montoya was not watching the accounting system properly. He was a relatively new medical center director. Uh, And one could argue that it's really hard to anticipate 
uh, when a medical center is going to need so much so so many resources to care for so many veterans. How do you think that this story ties in to the other stories we've been hearing for now going on a decade about long waiting times at VA hospitals and mismanagement at various facilities around the United States? Do you think that this is in some ways an outlier you're reporting on here, Peter, or is this part of a larger trend? This kind of story happens in various forms all across the country. So it, it would in some ways have been shocking if it had not happened at a certain facility, but it's often hard to pinpoint. I mean, in that same OIG report, uh, there were other allegations that um, one medical screening associate was aware of at least six patients who died while awaiting care at uh, the VA in White River Junction. But uh, according to this OIG report, the individual could not recall any of the names of the patients who died or any information or circumstances surrounding the conditions of their deaths. So veterans do die. Some of them die while waiting for care. The question is, were they waiting for care that could have saved their lives? And that is a very difficult thing to prove. Peter Biello from New Hampshire Public Radio is our reporter on the story. Thank you so much, Peter, for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Between a quarter and a third of homeless people have some sort of mental illness, and roughly that same percentage suffer from substance abuse disorder. Columnist Susan Campbell, who writes about housing and homelessness for the New England News Collaborative, tells the story of one man, Reggie Moten, who fits both of these categories. He illustrates the years of systemic neglect of mentally ill homeless people in New England. Susan, welcome back to Next. Thank you very much. Susan, who's Reggie Moten? Reggie is a gentleman you probably, if you ever saw him in the streets of Hartford, you'd drive right by. Reggie was homeless for about two decades. He was in and out of shelters. He lived in abandoned buildings, and he was recently housed in Hartford. He was dealing with a couple of pretty big issues. Reggie has uh, mental illness challenges, including depression, and he also um, is dealing with a substance addiction. Let's listen to some tape uh, we have of, of Reggie talking about his mental illness and, and what it meant to his life. You know, I would get depressed and I would go out and get a beer. I would, I would get depressed and I would go out and hang out on the corner and, and do what the next person was doing. You have to look as to why you continue to use. A lot of people, like I said, uh, are homeless or, or they suffer from mental illness and, and they don't know about it. I mean, they don't know about the mental illness, and, and, and they don't know why they continue to do the things that they do. But once you start looking into what's going on, the, the root of it, then you'll find answers, you know, and that's what I'm finding answers every day. How much of a correlation is there between homelessness and, and some sort of mental illness? It really depends on who you ask, but the, the numbers vary from anywhere from 20 to 25 percent of people who are homeless are dealing with some form of severe mental illness, um, and about that same percentage are dealing with some kind of chronic substance abuse. But if you talk about mental illness, not just severe mental illness, I've seen the numbers go up to 40 to 45 percent. What sort of help is available in the state of Connecticut specifically for people who are in the, the type of situation that Reggie found himself in, on the streets, uh, without a home, and facing some, some pretty serious mental health issues? Well, increasingly, there's more and more help, but traditionally, there's not been much. Um, it was just assumed that they would make their way. And um, I referenced in the piece that I wrote a really wonderful Boston Globe Spotlight team coverage of this from December that said we, we're using our jails as asylums now. If you go through, and I don't have the statistics, but if you go through the prison population and look to see how many people are dealing with mental illness, be it severe, be it chronic, um, it's pretty high because they don't necessarily have access to services. There used to be services provided for, for decades and decades at the state level, and they were in large institutions. Uh, all of the New England states had them, and over the course of time, they began to be shuttered or just shrunk in such a size that maybe only a, a few people are, are there. What sort of impact has that had on people, this deinstitutionalization that's happened over decades? The care that was offered in these institutions in no way reflect the best practices that, that we accept now are, are much more effective treatment. But what it did, and I, um, other people have said this better, but it created a perfect storm. With all these institutions closing down, there was no alternative 
nowhere for people to go. So while they maybe had housing, it was stable housing, it wasn't necessarily helping them with their mental illness or their substance abuse, they were at least housed. When the uh, state, and, and it's not just Connecticut, all the New England states started to close these institutions in a really respectable spirit of reform, they just put people out on the streets and there were no services available to them. The biggest prescription to help uh, so many people who have been homeless and certainly those dealing with mental illness is finding them housing. Here Reggie talks a little bit about uh, the, the real impact that that had on his life, getting his own apartment. I guess the biggest support that I, I've had uh, dealing with my depression and being homeless is having my own apartment because that changed, like I said, 75% of the way that I was feeling yeah. because now I have something to hold on to. You know, being homeless you and, and, and leaving the shelter, you don't have anything to hold on to. You know, you can leave your clothes there you, and whatever, you know, you, you don't have any kind of substance. But once you get some substance, uh, uh, for me, my apartment, you know, I don't want to lose this. Susan, this is something you've been writing about uh, for us uh, in a project on housing and homelessness for years now. And it really is the power of housing. How important is is having a house, a place to go for someone who's faced the life that Reggie has? It's critical. Um, housing ad- advocates call it housing first. It's, a, it's an idea that if you get someone stably housed, then you can provide all the other services. But if you think about the life of someone who's living on the streets, Reggie, he's not going to be able to meet his appointments. He, he's going to be looking for food. He's going to be looking for some sort of shelter. So his attentions are on survival. Once you're housed, at least the way it's explained to me, you can start looking outward. Um, when you're on the street, you have to look very much inward, and four walls is a jail. That's a jail cell, and and Reggie, bit by bit, has started to create a home for himself, and from that base, now he's he's seeking help for his mental illness, for his challenges otherwise, and he knows that he has to take care of himself and stay away from certain areas and, and think about his addiction. It will always be with him, and he can do that now. He has that base. Here, Reggie's talking a bit about that and, and the importance to his life. Well, I started out, man, the only thing I had in my apartment was my fish tank and an air mattress. And uh, from there, uh, I bought a little piece at a time, or I uh, was fortunate enough to, to be blessed to get a little uh, piece at a time. And those are the things that I need in order to be uh, comfortable in my own apartment because I don't want to put myself in a position to just watch four walls again. Because when you're watching four walls, then you don't see anything, you know? You don't see anything. So I have to put things within my walls that's going to show me that I'm making a change in my life. The, the troubling part for many people watching state budgets or city budgets right now is that programs like the one that helped Reggie get housing, well, they're facing some really tough times, and that's in part because of the, the difficult budget struggles that are happening at, at the municipal and the state level. And I think what people have to remind themselves, and, and I'm looking at this for my next piece, is that re- housing people like Reggie actually are, is cost effective. It saves money in the long term. And when we're talking about budgets, and everyone understands budgetary challenges, but if you cut off your nose to spite your face and create yet another perfect storm, then you once again have people out on the streets getting inadequate ina- care. And they, in the end, cost anywhere from forty to $75,000 a year as opposed to getting them housed. It's so much cheaper, inexpensive to house people and provide them with all the services they need. Before I let you go, Susan, I wanted to play one last piece of tape. Uh, Earlier, we heard Reggie talk about one of the things that makes his life in his apartment something that that he loves. he's He's got a fish tank. He tells us a little story about the about the fish that he takes care of. I had a a 10 gallon fish tank. And um, one day I just left the house and I was going um, down a one of the streets uh, near my house and I seen this 40 gallon fish tank and uh, you know I said to myself it don't look like it's broke 
So I picked it up, put it on my shoulder, brought it home, cleaned it up, and now I have about 40 to 50 fish in it. <laughs> and they're, they've been there for almost four months now. I like my fish because I could sit down and I could watch them dance in the water all day, you know? And, and, and um, you know, it, it's not a big thing, but if, if you, uh, took the time to watch fish swim. They don't, they don't swim normally. <laughs> they just do whatever they want to do. And they're so at peace. And, 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 and having that peace, watching the peace of them, brings me peace, peace in my life, you know? <laughs> he has a little bit, bit of peace in his life. I love that. He's very poetic, watching the fish dance. He would, when I was talking with him, he would say something and I would think, oh my God, that's beautiful. You know, and here's this man who now can share this kind of stuff with us that we may not have heard from. Susan Campbell writes about housing and homelessness for the New England News Collaborative. Uh, we'll have more links to her stories in a video where you can uh, see Reggie telling some of his stories at nextnewengland.org. Susan, thanks so much for talking. Thank you, Joan. You can find Susan's latest column along with a video and her interview with Reggie Moten on our website. Go to nextnewengland.org and click on Opinion. Coming up, Town Meets Gown. It's next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the Common Sense Fund, supporting the New England News Collaborative and its coverage of climate change and global warming. In a region known for elite private colleges, tensions between town and gown are bound to arise, especially when the economic gap between the university and the surrounding community is wide. Historically, the relationship between Yale and the residents of New Haven has been an extreme example of this divide, one of the country's most elite institutions in the heart of a majority-minority city, with struggling public schools and many of the other markers of urban poverty. But in recent years, that icy town-gown relationship has started to thaw. Next, producer Andrew Moraskin saw that warming trend in action at Collaboratory New Haven, an event series that brings people from Yale and the community together to brainstorm solutions to common problems. The mood at the Opportunity Center on Dixwell Avenue is upbeat. City dwellers of different stripes are milling around, pouring iced tea from mason jars, and munching on bings, which are some kind of noodle burrito from a trendy Asian place downtown. Jay Garns is an artist and New Haven resident. He says he's been to several collaboratory meetings, he likes Yale's art museum, and he has a few friends that go to Yale. But... Uh, I guess, like, I don't feel like uh, the majority of Yale or, like, Yaleys um, respect New Haven residents or, like, treat New Haven residents like we are actually a part of this city, and that's a frustration that I have, you know, like, living here my entire life and, like, having a lot of the city not be accessible or, like designed for me, but instead for like um, students and tourists and like their like um, parents who are visiting for like a couple weeks or so. I felt pretty alienated in the city for a long time and it only started getting better. Elizabeth Larkin, a caseworker, says she used to walk around New Haven angry until pretty recently. Back then, Larkin worked at upscale bars patronized by people from Yale. She says she resented the clientele. But I don't walk with anger anymore. And, you know, part of it is because I don't work at a bar anymore. But the other part of it is because I'm, like, actively engaged in dialogue with Yale students and a lot of other people around the city in different sectors. When Collaboratory co-founder Margaret Lee was a student at Yale, she really didn't walk around New Haven at all. So I spent four years at Yale, and during that time I didn't leave the Yale sort of campus, the bubble, if you will. I, I went to class, I went to dining halls, I went to uh, professor's offices, I went to other places on campus, but I never really ventured outside of Yale. Why not? Lee says, for one, she was busy and stressed. I mean, it was Yale, but there was another reason. At least I was told by a lot of peers and by 
you know, people like my freshman counselors that certain areas of New Haven were not safe for me to venture into. The message that New Haven was a dangerous place for students was actually institutionalized at Yale. During orientation, freshmen had to attend a session called the safety meeting. And that was the only program they had as an introduction to New Haven. That's Collaboratory co-founder Caroline Smith. And now, just this past year, they changed it from the safety meeting to Welcome to New Haven and brought New Haven residents in to talk about the various aspects of a New Haven that were important to them. Smith and Lee both graduated from Yale in 2014. They founded Collaboratory last year. It's not officially affiliated with the college. They call it a lab for community solutions. Here's how a collaboratory event goes. An organization from campus or from the community introduces themselves and shares three challenges that they want help with. Then the attendees break into groups and brainstorm. At the end, each group presents its ideas. When I visited at the end of March, the Yale Democrats were up at bat. In the past, that group has focused on state-level issues, but they want to get more involved locally. Josh Hotchman, the president of the Yale Dems, kicks things off. Um, so I'm a junior, I study history, um, and I started off with the Dems two years ago. When with their preppy haircuts and slim fit khakis, the Yale Dems stand out in this crowd. But their message is humble. We're all ears. The Dems want to know how they can partner with New Haven activists and how they can communicate to Yale students about what's going on in the community. And we're really hoping to get a lot out of this, so really your unvarnished um, opinions are really appreciated. And unvarnished is what they get. Their motives are questioned. And won't they just be here for four years and leave? When asked about New Haveners' perceptions of Yale students, one resident said they don't get out of the way when you try to pass them on the sidewalk. And he used a term I can't say on the radio. But once these frustrations were aired, everybody got down to the business of coming up with ideas for the Dems. One piece of advice I heard over and over, post up. What does that mean? Here's Kobe Zeifman, a biking and transit advocate in town. Maybe going out and they did this with like, for the, they're trying to change the bus system. Uh, the campaign's called Move New Haven. So what they did was they just posted up and talked with people waiting for the bus on the green. So show up in the park in the center of town and talk to people. Judging from the students' reactions, it looked like the thought hadn't really occurred to them before. Another concept that got traction, everything should flow both ways. This is social worker Janice Dixon. Relationships, relationships of two people. You can't have a relationship by yourself. So when you're going and doing maybe a tour in that area, maybe you ought to offer that to them to come to Yale. Because remember that a lot of people in New Haven know that the university is there but they don't actually get privy to walk around it and see what it has to offer and all this, that, and that. Afterwards, freshman Elias Mastakoris said the idea of offering tours to local high school students really stuck with him. I think that there's like a lot of, a lot of potential with that, kind of, I guess, exposing New Haven students more to the opportunities that Yale provides. Um, and also maybe, you know, even getting a, commit, a bigger commitment from the university to accept more New Haveners. Kind of presenting the opportunity and showing that it, that it is a possibility um, could end up in inspiring a lot of students. Overall, the Dems seem thrilled by the feedback and New Haveners are pretty happy too. Remember Elizabeth Larkin, the caseworker who said she used to walk around New Haven angry? I check in with her outside. She says she was a little surprised by how hard Janice Dixon and others came at the Dems in the beginning. Like one of her opening salvos was, um, I think, something like, why do you want this? Um, why are you here? What are you looking for? And so I think that surprised me a little bit that that was like the opening punch. But someone, some kid from Yale in khakis answered with like real, like, honesty and humility and desire to engage. In, in spite of the khakis. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have a pair. <laughs> I don't wear them tonight. <laughs> It's an acknowledgement that Yaleys and New Haveners may always have their differences, but maybe they can come to respect each other. That's next producer Andrew Moraskin reporting from New Haven. We now head about 90 miles up Route 91 to Amherst, Massachusetts. It's a town of under 40,000 people that is home to three colleges. 
The biggest by far is the University of Massachusetts. It has some 30,000 students and is the largest employer in the whole county. So how do town-gown relations shake out in a smaller place that's dominated by higher ed? I'm joined now by Tony Maroulis. He's executive director of external relations and university events at UMass Amherst. Before that, he was the director of the Chamber of Commerce in the town. He's part of the town-gown collaborative effort that's been underway for the past few years there. Tony, welcome to Next. Thank you, John. Thanks for having me. So you're part of the International Town Gown Association. So as you get together in this association, you talk about the big issues that are facing towns and universities these days. What are you talking about in 2017? Many of our inst- the institutions and the towns are struggling with the same issues. Um, and, and, and a lot of it has to do with issues in edge neighborhoods around campuses, you know, institutions and how they impact the local economy, et cetera. So, you know, some of the hot topic issues right now in 2017, actually, that are, that are rather new are, uh, you know, with marijuana being legalized in many states, uh, we're trying to learn lessons from our colleagues, from institutions in Colorado, from institutions in Washington, uh, as marijuana now is legal here in Massachusetts. Boy, so marijuana is going to be one issue that you'll have a little bit of information about. You've got a a lot longer history of how different college campuses and towns deal with alcohol and partying. What about that that issue of student parties and how it might strain relations between a community and the students on campus? Well, that issue, I think, um, it's it's something that we all face, and I and, and I don't think that there's any great rocket the science that goes along with it. Uh, it. It does mean that we have to talk to our community partners, we have to talk to our neighbors, and 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 we have to foster those relationships. Uh, we have to work with our students that live in those neighborhoods. Um, since uh, 2015, we've had. Uh, the neighborhood liaison program here in Amherst, where the Amherst Police Department um, has hired a neighborhood officer, and we, through university relations, have a neighborhood liaison officer as well. And what they do is they they walk out into the the edge neighborhoods by campus, talk closely with students, talk about behavior expectations, create relationships with them so that there is a two-way street in terms of information and trust. You know, we've seen a, a real reduction in call volume to the police. We've come up with some programs like uh, our party registration program, which allows students to kind of take the um, issue into their own hands. What it does is it, it allows students to get a phone call if there is a noise complaint. And they have 20 minutes to end the party or, or get the noise down. If the police do return, then, then a noise violation may be issued and, uh, you know, any other uh, corrective action. Um, our students have responded well to that. During the first semester, we had 165 parties that were registered. Um, 13 got a call, but there was no, no need to uh, do a follow-up call or a visit to any of those registered parties after that first courtesy call was made. When you talk about the edge neighborhoods for a a big university with a lot of students, you have the student population spilling out into the town, so off-campus housing is a big issue. How does that particular tension shake out in Amherst, the the tension of people living right next door to college students who maybe keep different hours or keep different lifestyles than the the folks who grew up and bought houses there a long time ago? Um, Over the last couple of years, I think, we have seen actually a, a lessening of, of real impact. Um, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples of what we've done through the town and in partnership with the university. A couple of years ago, we uh, did a program called Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods. And so through more rigorous inspections and even cooperation with our landlord community, um, we've seen an improvement in the type of property or or the properties that that, um, might have been single family conversions into uh, rental houses. Uh, There's been improvements there, there's been yearly inspections. Uh, And what that's done is is landlords have been more accountable um, and actually more communicative with both the the police and inspection departments within the town and then also with uh, staff here at the university. We've also seen um, a change in uh, the landscape uh, since uh, 2014 or so, with the emergence of a number of, of about 300 beds of managed apartment complexes, what that's done is that's changed some of the um, 
the makeup of, of those edge neighborhoods. So now we're seeing conversions back from houses that were single family to rental, and now they're going back uh, to single family homes again. There are some university towns like Boston that are huge, and they've got a pretty good shot of keeping people who spent four years at, at Boston University or, or Harvard or BC. Um, for a town like Amherst, how do you feel like you're doing in, in keeping people in the local area after they graduate? So the, the Pioneer Valley as a whole, um, we, we're going to be a net exporter all the time. I mean, we, we are a, a small area, and Amherst is a town of about 40,000 people. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that one, one of the th- we're, we're working on ways to get better. We have a number of uh, people that have settled in the area that don't necessarily have connections with the university that, that are from, uh, from uh, high-tech uh, industries. And many of them now may be independent or being able to work remotely. And they're, they're drawn here, not because they have an association with the university, but because of the university and the colleges that are here, uh, we have a high uh, quality of life. And so, so it has been um, an attractive place for, for these um, entrepreneurs to land. And, and many of them are looking to invest in, in some of the, the future um, business leaders of tomorrow. And so what we're seeing in, in our town is the emergence of co-working environments and, and different locations where um, people from what, what's called the hidden tech community here come and meet um, and there are opportunities for investment. Uh, business, business incubators and accelerators have, have emerged over the last couple of years. So while I think we'll always be a net exporter, if we create a pipeline that allows for the incubation and, and the beginning of small business or, or, or business idea here in the Valley and, and help foster it um, before it moves on to Boston or to New York City or to Silicon Valley, um, I think that we'll be we'll be quite successful, and, and and that's our goal, really. I mean, you know, we're not looking to expand our, our area and make it, you know, uh, uh, you know, millions of people here. But but what we would like to see is that pipeline grow and and you know be the starting point for for many of our young um, college graduates uh, who are looking for success. A uh, uh, last question for you. I know that commencement's coming up pretty soon, and the students go home. How, how different is the town of Amherst during the summertime? Well, um, I grew up on the Jersey Shore, so it's very similar to winter on the Jersey Shore, I think, in, in a way. Um, we're busier, though, than that. Uh, so the, it should be a little bit more. Um, it's, not, it's not quite the same. Uh, you know, we, we, we are still um, an active campus. Um, you know, we have sports camps. We have our summer program. Uh, there are a number of conventions, uh, literary festivals here on campus as well during um, – during the break, it's it's certainly not as as busy um, as it as it is during the school year. So for those that are year round residents, uh, the tr- they are always happy about the traffic impacts <laughs> and and how that changes. Tony Marulos is executive director of external relations and university events and a member of the leadership team for the University Town of Amherst Collaborative. Tony, thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you, John. Coming up, refugees tell their stories in words and music. It's next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the Melville Charitable Trust, supporting the New England News Collaborative and its coverage of housing and homelessness. Storytelling is built into cultures around the world, and it's a way of socializing and passing down family histories. It can also reveal common ground. Finding that common ground is what a New England Refugee Resettlement Agency hopes to accomplish with a new traveling series of live storytelling performances. Reporter Shannon Dooling sat in on a recent rehearsal. I love this. I think we all really connect when someone else is authentic or honest. What else makes a good story? How do you know someone's telling a good story? Cheryl Hamilton scribbles down pointers on a giant sticky note, leading a group brainstorming session. The group is gathered in the lobby of the International Institute of New England in Lowell, Massachusetts. Among them, refugees and first-generation immigrants, award-winning orators and first-time storytellers, all seated in a circle together to learn more about the art and the power of telling a story. 37-year-old Zuleika Ali, a Somali refugee and mother of five, stands in front of the group and practices her own story. It begins when she was a child. 
I'm 11 years old. I just had my dinner. I'm sitting with my mom in a Somali traditional house called Akal. She was telling me a story about an animal that lives with water and grass only. Suddenly I heard voices out. I saw some men outside talking to my dad. I didn't know what they were saying. Later on, my dad came in and told us they want our boys to go and fight. Ali's story goes on to recount her family fleeing war-torn Somalia in 1991. After spending 20 years in a Ugandan refugee camp, they settled in Lowell, Mass. in 2014. Through her story, Ali hopes to relay the elements of what it's like to be a refugee, bouncing from country to country, and the toll it takes. It's even worse than the war that you have fled. So I'm very happy to the countries that they have warm hearts, they have received us well. So I want to share my story as a refugee, what I've gone through, what I've seen. I've always said that storytelling is the fastest way to connect to your neighbor. That's Cheryl Hamilton again, who not only heads up the International Institute's Lowell site, but also serves on the board of Massmouth, a statewide storytelling group. Hamilton says for a few years now, she's been trying to fuse the worlds of refugee resettlement and live storytelling. She sees it as a way of breaking down cultural barriers and turning strangers into neighbors. We can go to sports matches and have a great time and cheer together. We can watch a movie and enjoy the film. But storytelling is where you share a human experience with somebody else and you start to reflect yourself in them and just are transformed into someone else's life immediately. With growing political attention on refugees and immigrants, Hamilton says the traveling storytelling event called Suitcase Stories is an opportunity to bring communities together. And it's not just about uniting refugees. The series also invites U.S.-born community members to share the same stage and share their own stories, connecting immigrant experiences across generations. Experiences like those of Rose Saya. Her grandfather came from Sicily in the early 20th century and settled in the mostly Irish neighborhood of South Boston. It was a difficult transition, one that she sees mirrored in some refugee experiences today. My uncles and my father were beaten up every day, and I grew up being called names. And I think there's a lot of things that happened that I heard as stories at my table and that happened to me, that here we are, not that much later, and the same things are happening again. Saya says she can relate to contemporary immigrants struggling to feel at home in the U.S. She's hopeful that audiences will also be able to identify with stories like hers and the stories of refugees like Ali. In Ali's story, her dad refuses to allow her brothers to fight in a war among different clans. At around 5 a.m., I had this huge sound. I thought that I was dreaming. Then I saw my mom also waking up and she, did you hear? I said, yes, I heard. We all ran out. Everything was scattered. There was blood everywhere. My mom ran to the cattle yards. She found out my two brothers dead. Ali hopes that listening to stories like hers can help people move beyond politics. Standing in front of the rehearsal group, Ali's practice run comes to a close. 24 years later, I'm here in Lowell, pursuing my degree as a nurse, driving, which I never dreamed of, helping my children with their homework. Life is very good here. Have it practiced, I'll practice more. She sits down and listens to feedback from her fellow immigrants, her fellow storytellers. That's Shannon Dooling of WBUR in Boston reporting. Of the 530 refugees who arrived in the New Haven, Connecticut region last year, more than 270 were children. Many of them are nearing the end of their first year in a U.S. school. WNPR's Diane Orson reports on an arts program that's partnered with the region's resettlement agency to create a special after-school violin class for these young refugees. The regular school day is over and it's time for violin class to begin. A girl is leading her peers in the helicopter game. They're practicing how to place a violin bow on the string. Helicopter up. She gently brings the bow down. Landing. And it's time to start making music. Students 
Students in this class range in age from 8 to 14, and all are refugees from Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Somalia. Their teacher turns now to a technique called pizzicato. As the children pluck the open strings on their instruments, she begins to play a tune. Teacher Yaida Matikobova is a senior resident musician with Music Haven. The program provides free musical instruments, one-on-one lessons, and group ensemble coaching, plus trips to concerts, all without charge, to more than 75 low-income students in New Haven. Matya Kobova says the idea for this class began when Music Haven students learned that refugee families were being resettled in New Haven. When we heard um, about refugees fleeing from their homeland, going by foot, trying to escape the war zone, the conversation was brought up in our class. And initially, the kids are the ones who started the idea of wanting to meet the refugees and possibly play music for them. My name is Nurhan, and I am uh, 12 years old, and I am from Iraq. How long have you been here? Mm, One year. I like music, and I like to play with uh, the instruments. And tell me about your teacher. I love her. She is smiling. Even we are making mistakes, she is smiling. The program aims to help refugee children make new connections. It may also help them academically, psychologically, and socially. James Catterall is emeritus professor at UCLA and director of the Centers for Research on Creativity. That deep engagement and liking for what they're up to makes a real difference. And I can imagine for a refugee population, having a, as, I mean, a haven's a pretty good word. It's a place for the children to sort of emotionally and physically hang out and enjoy themselves and enjoy music. So that's a start. Music also benefits spatial reasoning, and that may help in learning a new language. Back in class, teacher Mati Kobova encourages her students to sing. We are learning music from just simple tunes from Syria or Afghan melodies, as well as Twinkle, Twinkle Little Star. Now I said to take a bow, one and two and three. That's ha! My name is Ahmed. Uh, I'm 14 old. I'm from Syria. I like to play violin because you can learn more. English and everything. Ahmad al-Zawabi, his sister Noor, and their family recently arrived in New Haven. Noor says her brother practices his violin diligently. Every day I listen for him because uh, I think uh, the music language, all the world understands this language. So I very like that my brother uh, learn violin or learn anything about music. Teacher Yaida Matikobova was born in Uzbekistan and came to the U.S. at age 16 with a backpack and her violin. She says she understands the kinds of social challenges these young people face. And when I first came here, I didn't know the language and I didn't know the culture. And it took me some time to learn. And I find that through music, it brings us together and we can really embrace and um, rely on that in the times when it's more difficult. Matya Kobova says she hopes the classes will help to instill in these young refugees a love of music, a feeling of belonging, and a greater sense of confidence about their place in the world. That's Diane Orson reporting. You can find a short video of the young refugee students learning violin at nextnewengland.org. I highly recommend it. Next is produced at WNPR by Andrew Moraskin. The executive producer is Katie Talarski. The digital editor is Heather Brandon. Production help this week from Robin Doyen Aitken and Jill Kaufman. Our theme music is by composer Todd Merrill. You can hear more of his music at toddmerrill.com. Thanks also to Goodnight Blue Moon for their song, New England. 
The New England News Collaborative is funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and it's powered by WBUR Boston, Vermont Public Radio, New Hampshire Public Radio, Maine Public Radio, Rhode Island Public Radio, WSHU Public Radio Group, New England Public Radio, and WNPR.